Record. Thank you. Aha, there we go. So we're told. Uh, well, that which means now that we can share with people who aren't here tonight. So I'm not going to speak for a very long time. I'm just going to introduce Catriona, who lives in Thames Ditton, so she knows our local issues here. Um, she's a chartered town planner. I've got all this off your LinkedIn profile, Catriona. Um, she's, uh, she's been working on planning policies since 1990, including things like the joint strategic plans for local councils, which, of course, is quite a hot subject because our local plan was hopefully uh, coming any day now. Um, she's worked on things like the Southeast relationship with London, which is again quite an issue for us because we are on the border with London, and things such as the Surrey Structure Plan, and she's won at least three national awards, so well done Catriona, and uh, to have our very own planning expert uh, on our doorstep and also um, giving her time up to the meeting is, is a great bonus for us. So we're going to give Catriona about 40 minutes to talk. If you would like to show your support for something she says, you know, you can do your thumbs up or clapping or wave your hands because it's quite nice when you're talking to see reactions from people. Um, but apart from that, if everybody else can go on to mute, uh, I'll hand over to Catriona. Okay, so over to you, Catriona. Thanks, Stella. Yeah, uh, I'm a, as Stella said, I'm a Thames Ditton resident. I've lived in the area, despite the accent, for uh, over 30 years. Um, so I'm sort of uh, well rehearsed and was at Surrey County Council for 16 years um, of my, my work. So um, I, I, my main day job is working with local councils and I go in and uh, sort of advise them on their local plans and help them fix some of the problems. Um, so I do a lot of different things um, and I often call my work um, marriage guidance counselling because it, it, it feels like that. Uh, it's quite often trying to improve relationships between counsellors, professionals and, and local communities. And um, I think that experience has, has been um, very well used and probably could be used a bit more in places like Helmbridge, sadly. <laughs> so I'm going to, I've got three slides, which I'm hopefully going to be able to share with you because I thought it was easier to put some words on a bit of paper that you can see. But also um, I've said to Della, if you want a copy of it afterwards, I'm more than happy for you to, to get a copy. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to see if I can uh, share it nice and easy. I'm just wondering if I have to make you the host. No, you shouldn't oh. do it. You should be able to oh, see no. it now. That's work, thanks. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it does. Sometimes uh, you do have to be a bit more proactive in it. Right, so uh, there we go. So I've only got three slides. Um, I will go through these. Uh, Take notes. If there's something that uh, you want to ask, I'm more than happy. If suddenly, if, if you're, you're worried about forgetting it, um, then you know, stop me. Um, but I'll probably cover it anyway. So I'll go through the three slides. The first one is really about um, when I do work with local authorities, what I think you do to prepare a local plan. So bear in mind, this is sort of 30 years of experience, and I've witnessed many, many good plans and many, many bad plans. So this is sort of a, a culmination of good practice and bad practice that has to be said. Um, and I think the most important thing for any local plan that it's not a housing plan, it's, it's a place shaping document and it has to be seen as a place shaping document. And I think over the last 10 years or so, we've sort of lost our way a little bit in local planning and it's been focused on how we're gonna meet housing numbers and not about how we're gonna shape our communities. So I'll, I'll start with that. And the things that go into a plan, and again, this is really important um, in terms of um, what a local plan, what the key ingredients are. And this should be any local plan. This isn't just a good local plan. This should be any local plan. So obviously you've got your technical evidence. So lots of different reports, a lot done in house, a lot done through external consultancies. Um, and the very clear message there from government is it should be a proportionate evidence base. You shouldn't be spending millions and millions of pounds on evidence, constantly uh, turning out evidence. You should be focusing in on the key areas and developing some uh, your evidence base. There is, of course, some statutory requirements in a local plan, and it is a statutory process, uh, the, the statutory development plan, and it is highly legalistic in many ways. Um, the first one there 
some of you will be familiar with the phrase duty to cooperate. And the duty to cooperate was uh, brought in in 2011 to replace, uh, we used to have regional planning. I was director of planning for the Southeast region uh, when I left Surrey. Um, and then the, the coalition government uh, abolished that and replaced it with duty to cooperate. They are now proposing to abolish the duty to cooperate because it has been incredibly ineffective in trying to help local authorities manage growth across uh, across local authority boundaries. Um, so you have to legally meet the requirements of the duty to cooperate and it is usually the first test when you get into an examination that uh, an inspector will look at, they will see if you are legally compliant in that. The next statutory requirement is your public consultation and some of you again will be familiar with a statement of community involvement and that is where the local authorities is supposed to set out how it will engage with local authorities. It's required to consult at two stages and again many of you will be familiar with the terms regulation 18 consultation and regulation 19 consultation and they are the two required phases of consultation. However, a good local plan um, should be, uh, there should be engagement throughout the whole process in a good local plan. It's, it shouldn't just be at the statutory consultation stages. And again, I have seen some very poor examples of that and some very good examples of that. And then the final statutory requirement, which is the bit that tends to end up in the High Court, is around sustainable, uh, sustainable environmental appraisals and sustainability appraisal. And this is where local authorities have to test different options of how they're going to deliver their plan. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very specific process that they have to go through, but quite often uh, they are challenged on that um, legally at the end of the process, at the end of the local plan process, once they come out of the examination. And it tends to be the one where uh, developers will focus on challenging. Um, and these are really the only three areas that at the end of the process are subject to any sort of high court challenge. So they're really, really important for local authority to try and get right. The next part that goes into any local plan is the national policy requirements, and that is through what we call the MPPF, National Policy Planning Policy Framework, and that is set by government, and that is where all the requirements around housing and everything else are set. There is also national planning, uh, national po uh, planning guidance. That is not policy, that is treated as policy by many people, but it is not policy, it is guidance and it is, um, it is therefore, uh, you, can, you can take it or leave it basically. The next one, and this is the one that quite often gets forgotten about, and that is your corporate and political priorities. A local plan is developed through the democratic process. If your corporate or political pro priorities weren't important and weren't a factor in your local plan, then most local councils could just hive it off to consultants and get them to do that. So it's a really important part and that is of course informed by um, your consultation and election results. It's not dictated and again it's back to that sort of, uh, this has to be considered alongside all the other things it is not the only thing so the consultation results are not the only factor that gets taken into account it, it is and it, it but it does have to inform it and then the final one there are what i put as other influences so there's a whole lot of other things that are mostly outside um, the local authorities gift but also are subject to partnerships and are much more of the sort of what I would call the place shaping things so climate change strategies, economic strategies, the county council's local transport plan, even health and well-being strategies have things in it that are about how a local plan should um, deal with um, supporting sort of health and well-being of communities and um, so these are all important in terms of what they're saying and mostly they are done through some form of partnership and a lot of them are done at the county level. In places like Surrey you also have um, the Surrey Place Ambition which is an attempt by the local authorities and partners to try and envisage a long-term strategy for Surrey and make sure that investment priorities of all the different players are actually aligned and actually making sure that the, the infrastructure and other things are going into it. So there's another really important part. So, so none of these are statutory, but they are important parts, components uh, that go into a local plan. When you have all that, and 
it's up to the local council to develop their strategy and their plan. So they set out what they're trying to do and how they're going to do it. Now, I've highlighted the words an appropriate strategy because I think this is going to be really important, potentially in an Elmbridge context. The inspectors at an examination for a local plan used to test a local plan for the most appropriate strategy, which implied there was only one way to do it. That was changed a couple of years ago to reflect the fact that there are many different ways to skin a cat, as they say, there are different ways to have a plan that is sound, technically sound, that is legally compliant, um, and that reflects local context and gets through the system. And they can all look quite different. Um, and I think that that's important because there is no one answer. A lot of this is judgment. A lot of this is putting your priorities um, and deciding what your priorities are and uh, wait, weightings in terms of what you, you consider important, your values, all of these things go into it, which is why it is so important that a local plan must be prepared in collaboration between officers and members. The officers are there to advise professionally and they do most of the time do a very good job. Members are there to make judgments, calls and uh, place values and priorities on different things and decide what is in the interest of their local community. So as long as the plan is technically sound, so it, is, it ticks the boxes in terms of what's required nationally by government, it is legally robust and is not subject to challenge. Uh, there is a very big grey area around what else uh, a plan looks like. And technical evidence is very rarely black and white. It is affected by professional judgment. If you ask a consultancy to do a study for you, and you ask three consultancies to do studies for you, they will all come back with different answers. And that comes down to things as much as employment projections. You can ask three different uh, companies to give you some uh, projections around employment, and they will come back with three different answers. So it is very rarely black and white. A lot of planning is not a science, it is very much an art, and it is very much about making sure that it is delivering the things that you want it to, to deliver, even though there are different ways to do that. So when a plan gets to what we call the Regulation 19 stage, which I think is where the, the Elmbridge plan is just about to get to, that is the plan that is supposed to be the final plan that you want to see, the council wants to see come out the other end. That's the plan that when it goes into examination to get tested, they want that plan to come out the other end. It's not supposed to be the inspector's job to change it all and make it legally compliant and technically sound. It's supposed to be already like that when it goes in. So an, excuse me, an inspector's job is to basically um, evaluate, evaluate it at a fairly high level um, and do some form of risk assessment. They, they, they are not supposed to forensically test um, the plan. However, again, another important point in terms of the examination stage, the local authority has a contract with an individual inspector, not the planning inspectorate. And inspectors are individual human beings. They apply different judgments and different rules as well. So depending on the inspector you get, you could have a very different outcome. And I know, I've known inspectors that want to forensically examine every single aspect of the plan and some that take a much more um, sort of strategic approach to the plan and uh, you know but at the end of the day the plan is supposed to be the council's plan uh, and the plan that they want to see come out the other end. There's been a lot of discussion around intervention and what role the, the government has and what the risks are of local government uh, of, of government intervention. And I think the last time I counted, there must have been over 40 different ways that, I said that the Secretary of State or the government could intervene in local planning, but it is very, very rarely used. And for those that have come close, I've worked with every single one of them and I have been in the room with very senior officials from government talking about the chances of full intervention. And, and let me tell you, they are very, very small. Even in South Oxfordshire, which was the most uh, sort of high profile, uh, where they decided they didn't like their plan after a change in leadership. Um, but that plan was part of a, an Oxfordshire wide approach, which had about 500 million pounds invested in Oxfordshire. 
and most of it in South Oxfordshire, when the Secretary of State said, well, hang on a minute, we've just given you 500, 500 million pounds, you can't pull the plan because, you know, you've got the money. Um, and even at that point, uh, there was a, a way in which that problem was solved without the Secretary of State intervening. Um, yes, there was moves towards it, but it never actually happened. So, you know, the risks of a, a government coming in and taking the plan away from a local planning authority are very small um, and we need to make sure we put that in context. So in terms of just the general developing a local plan, um, the time scale, uh, there's a lot of arguments about uh, local authorities, particularly in the southeast, particularly Greenbelt councils, not getting up to date plans in place. So the Secretary of State has now said all local plans across England need to be up to date by December 2023. So we've still got quite a bit of time for that, um, but I think the, the planning inspector will be very busy over the next couple of years because the race is certainly on. So I know you, some of you will be interested specifically around the housing issue, so I will cover that off and I will talk specifically around Greenbelt because it is uh, one of the, the most confusing uh, and politically sensitive areas uh, in, in planning policy. And you know, since I've worked in the South East and specifically around Surrey for, for 30 years. And uh, you know, I've, I know Greenbelt policy like the back of my hand, um, but it is very often misinterpreted and misused. And I have to say that is also sometimes by my own profession as well, um, who don't, understand it. Um, so boosting housing supply, no surprise there, is um, a national priority and it was interesting today the government published its um, review of reforms of civil servants and what uh, the civil service and the government and how they're going to do it and they listed some um, priority areas and yes climate change and the environment were there but right at the top of the list was boosting housing supply um, so it is absolutely the top priority for Mr Johnson and his government um, and the planning reforms which we'll talk about in a minute have basically been done or are being done to help that that policy objective um, and local plans are always, they're not the only way of boosting supply. Um, we're increasingly seeing a lot of councils now developing their own lands, particularly for affordable housing. So we're seeing a lot more uh, direct supply of housing that hasn't really gone through the local plan process. So, um, and also you will be aware probably of the, the push for permitted development where uh, you have there's sort of a much more permissive regime where you don't have to go through all the hoops and um, to get more housing done. So there are different ways, but the main mechanism for delivering housing is through the local plans. And local plan housing targets are developed in two stages. Um, the standard methodology, which is the government's um, approach to setting housing needs for every local area, that is considered the starting point. Um, and local authorities, we've always, whatever regime I've worked in in the planning system, there has always been a demographic based starting point. And we've always called it a policy off starting point because it is your sort of this is this is what you should be trying to achieve. And then you apply the policies, which no surprise there, we call it the policy on approach, very, very technical jargon, but it says what it says, what it says, um, says what it does. Um, so the, the stage one is the standard methodology number, and then the stage two is where the local authority applies its policies and basically the government have said you should try and meet your needs in full um, unless it, it, it compromises other national policy objectives including things like Greenbelt. Um, and interesting last year the largest 20 largest urban areas in England which includes London but it also include, includes places like Brighton and Hove which is highly constrained they are now expected to, to deliver 35 percent above what they were already expected to to deliver through the standard methodology so the you know there is a huge pressure now for these urban areas to, de to develop to, to build more and, and that was in theory part of the leveling up agenda which you may be aware of which was about sort of leveling up the uh, disparities across the country um, and a lot of this will obviously go to northern and, and midland, area, midland areas but the, the southeast doesn't escape so where an area is heavily constrained by by green belt a local authority will, and the, the housing numbers are 
fairly high, like most seem to be these days. Um, the local planning authority has to work proactively with its neighbouring authorities through that mechanism I mentioned called the duty to cooperate, where they basically say, look, I can't meet my needs, or we can't meet our needs, can you help? And Guildford, for example, has helped Woking out um, and many other local authorities, Horsham, Tents and Mid-Sussex tend to do uh, a lot of the, the heavy lifting around sort of the Sussex area because they're less constrained than other areas. Um, but as you, as you imagine, there's places like Elmbridge and Epsom and Spelthorne and places like that that are uh, surrounded by Greenbelt councils. So it's very unlikely that their neighbouring authorities aren't going to be in a position to help them out. So if you've done the process, and it is very much process driven, if you've done the process, you've asked the right questions, the answer comes back and it's no, and you still have a shortfall, then you have to be very, you have to make sure that you look very carefully at how you can um, increase density, for example, in existing urban areas. And, and I know that scares a lot of people, but actually a lot of that helps improve the urban areas. And actually it's going to be one of the things I think we're going to have to do, regardless of the Greenbelt situation, to address issues around climate change. So it is a big issue. Um, and only then, when you've done sort of looked down every rabbit hole, um, are you, should a local planning authority then consider releasing Greenbelt to meet their needs? Um, and this is where, um, again, many of you will have heard the exceptional circumstances, and this is where a local authority decides, right, we can't meet our needs, none of our neighbours can help us, we are being expected to hit this target, but we can't compromise the green belt unless there are bits of green belt that, that that could be lost because they no longer perform any green belt function. Um, or the needs for housing, for example, outweigh any other needs. Now, the most important thing here is, and I haven't actually seen this from Elmbridge yet, is that in order to decide whether there are exceptional circumstances and only the decision maker, i.e. the local planning authority can make that decision, they are the only ones that can decide whether there are exceptional circumstances to release Greenbelt. And that means they've got to go through a cost benefit analysis. So they have to, they have to weigh up the costs of releasing any green belt with the benefits. So Guildford, for example, decided that uh, they had the, the needs for housing were so great and they could afford to lose some green belt because it, it didn't impact, it, it, it's sort of outside the M25, there's a lot more green belt in that area that could be lost. Um, then they weighed up the pros and cons and cut, came to the conclusion that they, they could release some green belt. A different local authority could have come to a very different conclusion. Um, so it's up to local authority to look at what the costs and the benefits are of releasing any green belt and decide whether there are an exceptional circumstance, if there are exceptional circumstances to do that. For me, with green belt, green belt is a strategic policy. It should never be managed at a local planning authority level. The Metropolitan Green Belt should only be tested and changed at the metropolitan level, the London city region wide level. And we, we don't have any mechanisms since 2010 to do that, which is why so many local planning authorities individually are uh, looking at their own Green Belt reviews and why there's been a lot of green belt lost in, in recent or proposed in recent years. So if a local planning authority decides that there are exceptional circumstances, then they have to go through a methodology process to decide which sites are going to be released. Importantly, when, once they've made that decision, they then go into an examination and they are open to scrutiny. More sites can actually be lost as a result or different sites can be lost. So well, when Hatfield um, in Hertfordshire at the moment is four years into its examination, I think it's the longest examination in history, and have, our, I think, five uh, Greenbelt reviews down. So they went and they opened Pandora's box, they went into the examination and they said, okay, we're, we need to really, we've got exceptional circumstances, we need to release some Greenbelt and it didn't meet, still didn't meet, it was about 4,000 new homes, but uh, it still didn't meet the full needs. And the inspector asked them to go back and look again five different times. So they are still in a situation where the plan that they, they submitted is not the plan that they want. So it will be interesting to see what they do with that. 
if you go into an examination and you have not made the case for exceptional circumstances, so the local planning authority has decided that the costs of releasing green belt, any green belt outweigh the benefits, um, then they have to make clear that they have looked down every rabbit hole, they have considered absolutely every option, they've met the duty to cooperate um, to get the, the numbers up, but they still have a shortfall. Um, the inspector cannot tell them to go away and look at Greenbelt. And it's a really important point here. The A can't tell them that there, is a, there are exceptional circumstances and B can't tell them to go and look at Greenbelt. All an inspector can do is say to the local authority, are you absolutely sure you've looked at every possible option? Can you go away and look again? And the local authority can go away and look again. But the local authority can still come back with exactly the same answer. And, um, Brighton and Hove, although it's not Greenbelt, was in a, a similar in a, that sort of situation where it's obviously it's, it's got the the English Channel on one side and the South Downs National Park on the other side. It's heavily constrained, very urbanised, um, and they they eventually came out with um, their I think their forty six percent of the standard met they're, they're, they're meeting their housing needs um, because they were told to go away and think again. They went away again reviewed every possible option came back and said no we've we've reviewed everything the inspector considered what they've done as robust and said fair enough there's, there's no nothing else we can ask from you and that's the difference between that stage one target the the sort of the standard methodology number and the sort of the second stage and i know there are a lot of um uh, local people that would like to have a different starting point and you know the, the MPPF does allow an exceptional case to um, start with a different housing needs assessment and um, some people, some of us, three years ago said to Elmbridge you should do that but you should work alongside Spellthorn and Epsom and uh, places like that because you're all in the same boat, you've all got the same sort of housing market, it's very complex, you know, the standard methodology, which assumes we can basically build enough houses to reduce housing house prices, doesn't work in this area, it's a very different housing market. Um, that didn't happen, um, and I think now it's just too late for that, um, I think, and, uh, and the most important point there is, it is only the starting point. The most important thing that Elmbridge needs to do is get a very robust answer to why it can't meet that in full. Um, because I don't think the government will let anyone away with, or very few of them away with a different starting point, other than there has been, um, again, some of you will be familiar, recent challenge on the ONS base that's used in the standard methodology. Um, and there was a very particular issue around the way students had been assessed. Um, and that, ha that might have implications for Guildford, for example, and the standard methodology for places like Guildford, again, Brighton, Portsmouth, Southampton, some of the smaller cities where um, the, there is actually quite a significant um, student population and it does make a difference when they all leave. Um, and there's also debates around the, the demographics that underpin the standard methodology generally. And I think I'm hoping that will be addressed when the government does move forward with its reforms. But I think my advice would be move on now. It's been done. It, we've sort of missed that boat. Um, let's get make sure Elmbridge uh, has a really robust plan in place and a good defence for its numbers, um, which I suspect will be below. Um, what the standard methodology says. Right, and I'm going to finish off very briefly with looking to the future and what the government is saying in terms of planning reforms. Now, there's a huge amount in this. There's a lot around sort of the development management application process, um, infrastructure funding, resources, everything else. But I've just put down here some of the key points in terms of plan making, because I think that's the bit that the government is trying to change the most. Um, and um, the Planning for Future white paper was published last August, so nearly a year ago. Uh, it is The government is expected to publish its formal response to the consultation where they received 44,000 responses. So it's due to, to uh, publish its response, uh, uh, certainly before the planning bill is published in the autumn. 
Um, and I suspect most of this is going to end up coming around um, around the sort of October, November stage. Um, we'll start seeing seeing that that what's coming out the planning bill because at the moment there's not an awful lot of depth to any of this, and even the planning white paper it was almost like a bunch of ideas without actually real thinking. But the headlines are that the local plans will have uh, basically land will be allocated into three areas: protected areas, growth areas, and re renewal area. And I think this is one of the areas that's been very controversial. And a lot of people talking about zoning. This is not zoning. Um, and a lot of the planning I've worked in the past had very similar area allocations like that. However, if the government does mean zoning, and there is, um, uh, you know, there is a there is a view that that is what the government meant, then that's an entirely different thing. And obviously, with with zoning, it, it, it's you need far more than three different zones to have a proper zoning process so there's a lot of debate around what the government meant what this actually means in practice and how it will work in practice so I think there's a huge amount to be uh, debated around this but until we know what the government actually intends by this I think it's it's a bit of a, a black hole. Um, housing targets as I said earlier are not mandatory uh, you have a starting point and then you are to develop your own local plan targets in future that stage one and stage two process will be done by government and they will become mandatory now again a lot of concern about this but for the last 40 30 to 40 years that has always been the case it only changed in 2010-11 when the MPPF and the Localism Act was introduced up until that point, the housing targets were mandatory, but they were informed by things like the Regional Assembly, by the County Councils and districts. So there was a huge amount of input into the figures, but they were still government set targets at the end of the day. So we're waiting to, I think that's been, I think the biggest backlash from uh, sort of conservative grassroots and councillors has been around that. So we'll wait and see whether that actually happens or not. The other area that I think there's been a lot of concern about is um, the requirement that local plans should be prepared in 30 months. And, you know, does that allow for sufficient uh, engagement with communities? Does it allow for proper testing? Yeah, you could do a local plan in 30 months, but would it give you a good place shaping document and something that is actually meaningful? Again, the jury's out, and I think there's a real pushback on that. Um, another area that councillors and others have been very concerned about is the, the lack of public participation allowed in the, the, the new process. Now, we have what we call a plan-led system. So decisions that come through the planning application stage are supposed to be reflect are supposed to reflect what's in the local plan but that assumes we've got a really good robust plan making system and frankly we don't so the government i think uh, personally i think it's a, it's a good ambition which is to say your plan is a really good plan and therefore you shouldn't have the debate at the planning application stage that we currently have now because you, it should be clear from the local plan whether that application is sound or not now Obviously, a lot of issues around permitted development and a lot of development will escape the planning application stage and the plan making stage. So that's another thing. But the, the government has said, basically, we want local uh, local communities to be far more engaged at the design level, the design stage and in preparing the local plans. So, again, you know, it's, it's a good ambition. Um, but, you know, in practice, will that work? Um, I'm not convinced. And then duty to cooperate, I think I gave a little cheer when I when I saw this. I think the whole nation uh, of develop or the whole development industry, whether you were a planner working for a uh, local authority, councillors, house builders, uh, were very relieved that the government had recognised finally that duty to cooperate does not work and that they need a different mechanism. And that's what I spend my most of my waking hours on is uh, helping develop what that new system might look like to replace the duty to cooperate. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop there. That's three slides. Um, and um, I am happy to have a discussion, take questions, whatever you want. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I was on mute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much, Katrina. That, that's really useful. And obviously, 
having got it uh, recorded, we'll be able to go back over that and read the slides again. So I will share this out on the website uh, later in case you came in late or missed any of it. So uh, we're going to have um, some questions now. Um, if you want to ask a question, you're probably, yeah, you're gonna have to come back on camera and uh, put your finger in the air and then I'll be able to see who, who wants to ask a question. If nobody's got a burning question first, can I just get mine in before I forget it? And it's about zoning, which is what you just talked about. And it's about my concern that there's this um, plan to build around transport. And you will know that the Jolly Boatman site is on the edge of Hampton Court Station. Would it be possible to make just Hampton Court Station a growth zone, a development zone? Or does a zone need to be bigger than that? You know, what's the criteria for zone? I don't know, uh, and that, that's the problem. So uh, in the traditional way that you would have these, these three zones, they would be much, much larger than that. But a traditional zoning approach, which is not what the government has set out, but might be what the government intends, then you could have that, that you could go right down to street level um, and allocate it as a growth area. So if, if the government is, determined to introduce zoning as a concept that, that, that what operates in other countries, then yes, that Jolly Boatman site could be allocated as a growth area. But there's also lots of constraints in there because it's impacting on a listed building and things like that. So it's not as straightforward as that. It doesn't mean that if it was allocated growth zone, the developers could do what they like and nobody can speak. Well, in, in, in theory, that's how other zoning works, where it is, uh, it, it's different scales of intervention from the local authority in terms of planning, at, full planning applications, permitted development. Um, the assumption in growth areas would be that you need less to be able to do it. But, but again, one of the questions that the government haven't answered is if you have a zoning area, um, and it's right bang next to an area of uh, protection like uh, Hampton Court Palace, then how does that work? So I think there, 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 there isn't an answer for that yet, Della, I'm afraid, no, because no nobody has any idea yet really what they mean. Okay, right. Well, that, that's my burning question over. So I think, Paul, you had your hand up first. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. Um, thank you, Katrina. That was, that was very interesting. Um, and uh, every time I attend one of these events, I always learn something new. Um, question, if um, a local planning authority has been through Regulation 18 um, and held consultations as, as Elmbridge has with residents um, and the, uh, for those who don't know, aside from the sort of the public consultations, which we've had two Regulation 18 consultations now, but in addition to that, Elmbridge uh, officers also invited um, residents associations and some other civic groups into the civic centre, obviously this was pre-COVID, um, <clears throat> to have some meetings and discussions and to listen to the feedback. If there is a clear message coming from residents, so for example, in our case, no release of Greenbelt land, and then the local planning authority, in our case Elmbridge, decides to pretty much go ahead and do a local plan that releases Greenbelt. What impact does that public consultation have, the voice of the residents saying no Greenbelt release? How does that play out with the planning inspector at examination? So back to that first slide about the components that go into a local plan and the fact that the sort of the consultation result is very very important, but it has to be um, it has to be managed along with all the other things that go into a local plan. And again, that's why it's so important when councillors work with officers to um, make sure that all these different things are taken into account. If it was you know absolutely unanimous, we don't want any green belt and uh, every councillor went through an election and got elected on that mandate then that clearly has strong weighting in it. It's down to the councillors to decide how much weight to give that, but, but you, would have to, you would have to give that a lot of weight, um, but it has to be also seen alongside what is required in terms of the MPPF and everything like that. Now, the MPPF allows the council not to release Greenbelt. You know, so again, 
we just need we need to make sure that officers are not treating a local plan as a housing plan and just looking for sites to, to, to tick an arbitrary magic number. So it's not really an answer, Paul, because um, it's up to the council to decide how much weight to give that consultation. But if every councillor was elected on that mandate, it would be very difficult for them not to give that quite a lot of weight in, in, their, in, in their final decisions. So just, sorry, as a very quick follow-up. You're going to push that. me now, aren't you? <laughs> well, no, is it, it, it's just to sort of understand the position, really, because if, if that was the case, if um, you know, the, the local planning authority does take Greenbelt forward, does put that into examination in front of the planning inspectorate, where do the residents have an opportunity to stand up and say, oi, hang on a minute, that wasn't what we said. We, they've ignored us our voice hasn't been heard. And to make the point that you've just made that, you know, pretty much damn near all of our councillors at the last election, all campaign and the elections before, campaigned on no green belt release. So they've all gone back on their election promises. Um, at what point, where do the residents have a voice? Because I know that the regulation 19, although it's conducted by the local planning authority, the uh, responses go into the system, but go to the planning inspector, they're not responded to by the LPA. So I appreciate that at regulation 19, you do have an option to submit written uh, um, you know, commentary back to the, the planning inspectorate, but is there a chance to actually stand up and say, hang on a minute, this is not what we asked for? So the, who an inspector invites to a local plan examination is pretty much down to that inspector. But I would say that there are two scenarios in which local communities would be brought into the room. One is if you are directly impacted. So in your case, if uh, they went ahead and proposed the Long Ditton site, then I suspect um, the Residents Association would have a seat at the table um, to argue the case. What what I have seen is where um, if, there, if the local residents across an area have, have expressed such a strong view that they don't want Greenbelt released at all, that they come together and are, so what an inspector won't do is invite every single residents association uh, or every, every group. They will far more likely to invite groups of residents association as a single unified voice. So if Elmbridge go forward with the Reg 19 plan, for example, and it includes Greenbelt, and there is a view across Elmbridge that that's the wrong approach and there is a different way that you could get a local plan through the system, um, I think if the local groupings came together in that unified voice and presented themselves in that way, it would be very, very difficult for an inspector to ignore that and not give them a seat at the table. Thank you very much. Um, so very there is useful. there is definitely a way. My frustration, I think, yeah, and my frustration is that these are things that should be sorted well before it gets to Reg 19 stage. You know, this should not be, it shouldn't be a surprise if Greenbelt is going to be proposed um, at the Reg 19 stage. At the moment, nobody knows what's going to happen with the Elbridge local plan. It shouldn't be a surprise because the communities should have been engaged throughout, not just at these two these two stages. There should have been far, far more engagement around the strategy, the vision for Elmbridge, um, what what communities really want Elmbridge to look like. And and I have to say that that means that there is, you know, you have to accept that you know Elmbridge has to support new housing and not just yep. affordable housing you know that housing has to be provided and back to that point I was making around uh, densification you know in, in, in urban areas if we're going to tackle climate change you know urban areas are going to have to take more and higher density but there is some fantastic ways of doing that that is makes these areas even better places to live in so, you know, we, we've got, what I get fed up with is I get told, uh, well, it's Greenbelt or Tower Blocks in Elmbridge. And we know that's not the case. That is a total and utter fallacy. Tower Blocks are rarely gonna be allowed in Surrey apart from Woking um, and maybe a couple of other places like Red Hill, but that is not Elmbridge. And that would never happen in Elmbridge. There are different ways of doing that. Um, so yeah, I think the more that communities can act with one voice, 
a unified voice and have a credible argument, um, then the more chance you have of getting a very good seat at the table and an inspector to listen to you. Thank you. It, it's interesting that you said that, Katrina, because you're probably aware of the AERC, are you? The, yes. The thing yeah. Here? Yeah. And that's come about quite recently. I mean, uh, Tony here, Tony Charles has done a lot of work on, on pushing that together. And it does seem to be giving, um, uh, reaching ears now because they do speak from one collective voice where before they were uh, divided into regions across. So, um, and I think uh, concerns about local democracy is, is kind of driving us. And this idea of zoning and that a zone could just then take all the local democracy out of the planning is, is quite a concern because I think we are concerned what's built in our environment. So um, the, the other thing with Greenbelt is that if they go forward with Greenbelt sites, you are going to end up with community versus community. Uh, yeah, you know, inevitably right. that's going to happen. So, yeah. so having that uni unified voice around no Greenbelt is yeah. probably the only way that's going to work. Yeah, that's right. And there was this temptation where you leave our bit of Greenbelt and you go and build on that bit of Greenbelt. Yeah, but, but now there's definitely a very strong collective voice here. Um, who else would like? Uh, Jan, would you like to ask a question? Hi. Hi. Hi there. Well, thanks so much for this excellent um, event. And I must say, everything you mentioned, Katrina, is completely irrelevant, including for, for Spellthorn, of course. Um, and, and the fear of playing out one community against another, we're seeing that already. Um, I, I don't want to obviously, con you know, take the focus away from Elmbridge at all, but we're seeing it in Spellthorn where Kempton Park residents are pushing for faster local plan because they think by releasing other green belt, they're going to protect theirs. And, and uh, Katrina, what you've also said about this, this, this mantra, if we don't build out, we have to build up, is, is one we've heard at Spalthorn Borough Council from the moment we were elected in as councillors. I mean, I've stepped down since, of course, but it's this complete disinformation campaign probably across the country, I wouldn't be surprised, where people get convinced into greenbelt development because they don't want high rises. Um, so, so it's a lot of disinformation. I find that really very troubling, as you say, on a local democracy level. Um, so it's it's good to hear if you say that, you know, the lack of um, consultation or the fact that every single councillor was voted okay. in no green belt, you know, no building on green belt basis. That's but even then, it would be difficult to prove, I guess. So you, you, we, we would all have to keep leaflets of councillors and things like that. I, I just think it's going to be a real uphill struggle, but I think uh, that you're all coming together in Elmbridge is such an encouraging sign. Um, and maybe one can work across Spelthorn and Elmbridge activists, because I think unless this is completely foremost in countless minds, pretty much every two days, you know, uh, you know, I think one has to become a real pest for, for, to succeed um, because, yeah, because I, I just think there's so many um, private interests behind it, a lot of money involved. So um, if councillors can ignore you, they probably will on that question. I think also with the Spellthorn issue, when I was uh, headed up the structural plan at Surrey and in the regional um, assembly, we took the view very clearly that the area within the M25 and adjoining, uh, roughly within the M25 and adjoining London was absolutely strategic greenbelt. It was the most fragmented, it was the most area that has been under pressure for the last sort of 40 years. And therefore, I, and, and it was the area that really performed that strong strategic metropolitan greenbelt function. So we never ever looked within that area to make news, which is why Guildford ended up with some and other places um, ended up with a bit more. Um, now I'm sure Guildford are not very happy about that, but at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the constraints within the M25 are going to just get more, they're going to have, they're going to get worse. There's going to be more congestion. There's going to be more air pollution. There's going to be more in terms of, uh, you know, impact on, on how we live, uh, health and well-being around green spaces and things like that, that area is the most um, under pressure. Um, so we always took the view that that's the area you just don't even look at, which is why I was saying, you know, if you had a strategic view of the green belt, I think 
that would come out. Um, so if I was Elmbridge, I'd be using that to full advantage. And I would have four years ago, worked with Spelthorne, worked with Epsom and Newell, worked with Mole Valley and worked with South Bucks and Seven Oaks and anybody else that had the same situation. And that hasn't happened, sadly. I think um, I think the the argument against um, if we don't build on green belt, then we have to build up is to challenge the figures, isn't it? Using ONS data, you know, the growth figures. Uh, unless we get people moving into our borough in droves, our actual growth figures are really quite stable. They're not as you know that that we need so many new houses every year, but that doesn't actually match the ONS growth figures. Would you like to make a comment on that? No, but I mean, Elmbridge is not, it's not a single entity in its own. It never has been, you know, you, people, I, I, my main shopping area is Surbiton and Kingston, you know, I'm, I'm a mile away from the London border. So I think it's, it's a difficult one to say that you should just be meeting your own domestic needs, um, because what is Elmbridge's needs? Uh, I moved here 30 years ago. You know, most of the people I know in Elmbridge moved from London. Um, you know, it's all part of a really complex housing market area. So it's quite difficult to challenge it on that basis. I think for me, the big, the, the, ch the, the challenge is the, 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 the view that if you, and it, this is where the standard methodology sort of comes in, where it said, these areas are the most expensive. We need to impact on affordability. Therefore, we need to get all the house builders to build as many houses as possible to reduce house prices. Now, since 2008, most small and medium firms have gone out of the market and most house, house building is built by seven or eight big house builders. They constrain the market, but they are businesses. They are there to make profit on behalf of their shareholders. So they're not going to flood the market in order to reduce price, prices and reduce their profit. The only way to deliver real affordable housing is by direct intervention by yeah. local authorities and others. Mm -hmm. So the whole premise of the standard methodology doesn't mm -hmm. fit. It doesn't fit comfortably with me, which is why a few years, well, to, when it was first introduced, a number of us said, get together with your neighbouring authorities, don't do it alone and challenge it. That didn't happen. Now, in the interest of protecting Greenbelt, I think the council needs to get a local plan in place as soon as possible. It has got all the bits, all the components there. It's got all the technical evidence. It's got the consultation. It's got what they said at the election. It's got everything there. But you can throw that up in the air and it can come down and land in a very different way. And it can come down and land in a way that that provides a technically sound plan, a legal compliant plan, and a plan that actually reflects what local communities want. You know, it's all there. You know, you just jumble up the different bits and put different values and, and place different judgments on it and you come up with a different a different plan. Um, so that for me is, it, it's sort of, we've gone past the argument about housing needs, demographics and everything else. Let's yeah. get a plan that we can all live with that, that is actually doing its job. And it is actually addressing things like climate change, health and well-being, and all these really, really, and, and economic recovery as much as anything else. You know, this we haven't escaped it in Elmbridge. No. Um, so, uh, you know. Uh, point catching. I'm gonna go to uh, Stephen now, who's had his hand up. Stephen? Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, you said um, that they uh, accepted Brighton's um, plan. Uh, but presumably they didn't meet their housing target. So what happens then, please? That's their housing target. They were, I think they were about 54% short of the housing target. Birmingham is the same. Um, I, I, I note today that um, Canterbury are actually going to double the government's target. They've decided to have a plan that has double what their needs are in order to fund major roads. Um, you know, quite a brave move. But, uh, you know, most local authorities, um, you know, Brighton did a, a good job. Basically, they presented the inspector with the, the fact that they can't meet their needs and bills. Their neighbouring authorities are highly constrained as well, so they can't help. Um, and they've looked down every rabbit hole. They've done everything that they can and they still can't meet their needs. And that's a sound plan. So is, is that a, an example that Elmbridge could follow? 
Well, and this is this is my this is my point about the starting point and the finish point. Um, if Elmbridge, it's got all the bits that could be argued not that they are in a difficult position and can't meet their needs in full. Whether they are willing to argue that, and you know the. What I hear is the risks of not meeting your need in full are that the government will take responsibility away for your plan, the plan inspector will find it unsound, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of risk assessment, I would say there's far more risk going forward with a plan that meets that, that attempts to meet the needs in full and releases green belt because you will get pushed to release more green belt to meet your needs in full than the rest to go forward with the plan that doesn't release any green belt but doesn't meet your needs in full and you've you've done due diligence in, in terms of duty to cooperate and everything else yeah. um, there's nothing in inspector if that plan is being done in a sound way and it's got a credible strategy credible argument that inspector cannot find that plan unsound. Now, it may be that the, the inspector will say to Elmbridge, go away and look again, you know, or, or push Elmbridge to go away and look at something yeah. again. But if Elmbridge comes back with the same answer, you know, what does an inspector do? They can't force it. And I'd like to see a Secretary of State that would intervene at that point. So it's, okay. down, to, it's down to having a credible strategy and say, my plan is technically sound. It is legally compliant. And it reflects what our local communities have asked us to deliver in terms of that place shaping document. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's the same plan. And then you just have to hold your nerve and defy Absolutely. the government. And, yeah. and that, is, okay. that is that is why having a plan that is made with professionals advising and offering professional recommendations, but is mm. owned by the councillors and the councillors at the end of the day, my ideal for any local plan examination is that the leader and the chief exec are the ones that go in and say, here's our plan, we're really proud of it, this is the plan we want. And the mm -hmm. communities are all sitting alongside saying, yeah, that's a that's a really good plan. We're happy with it. The developers will argue the toss regardless because of self-interest. Uh, yeah. You know, that, they're businesses. Yeah. OK, thanks very much. Uh, that, that's a really good point you made, that they're better not to release any green belt because if they can't meet their target, if they've released just a small section, they've more or less set a precedent then that more could be released. That's a really good point. You've made the case for exceptional circumstances at yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good point. So I was going to go to everybody suddenly moved around to Tony. He had his hand up next and then I'll come to you, Kath. OK, so Tony first and then Kath and then Greg. Right. Off you go, Tony. It's that feeling you have when you realise you're talking to yourself. So. <laughs> I have that all the time. <laughs> Hi, Katrina. Thank you so much for a, a, a terrific presentation i mean admirably clear and what is I think, fiendishly complicated but well <laughs> for the likes of us mere mortals um so you did a, a brilliant job thank you very much and i think we're also incredibly fortunate to have someone with your expertise um who is also a local you know who sort of also knows the kind of nitty-gritty of the minutiae of what's been going on here in the in Elmridge, so that's that's great. Um, uh, I mean, what what is what is really striking with this is that um, it's all quite chaotic, isn't it? I mean, you you sort of, <laughs> I mean, you've made a, you know, I'm very impressed with the sort of way that you can kind of look at this chaos and and kind of present it in a very, you know, in a sort of rational and, and ordered way. But it is. I mean, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it is chaos because it, it, I mean, it's all down to sort of interpretation and not least this, you know, this latest stuff that's coming out of out of um, 10 Downing Street, which of course is slightly different, of course, to the local plan. And I think there is a danger actually in people kind of muddling those two things because the local plan is also, is very much about, you know, it's very much controlled by the, by Elmbridge. Uh, or by the local authorities, um, whereas all this, this the, the white paper, etc., is a government thing. Um, and I think, I mean, part part of the problem that seems to me, but you'll correct me if, if I got this wrong, is that 
the, the people who need to understand this stuff don't really. Um, I mean, you said yourself that, um, I think you were talking specifically about the green belt and the, the sort of nitty gritty of the green belt um, legislation and so on. And you said your own profession, you know, by which I take that to mean, you know, pl planners um, and strategic planners themselves don't understand it. Um, and I mean, it seems to me the problem is that the councillors also don't really. I mean, I mean no disrespect to councillors, but they the, the, the danger is that they can be manipulated by officers. My worry is that we don't actually have truly independent councillors. I mean, they, of course, they say things at elections and they and 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 people then you know vote that we residents then vote for them and so on and so on. Um, but they can be the the, the officers have an all it seems to me have an awful lot of sway over these councillors and I just worry that there isn't enough backbone um, from the councillors they maybe want to do the right thing I don't know but they could be kind of talked out of it um, and I worry that the system doesn't really prevent that um, and in turn you know the officers want a, how can I put it, they want a comfortable, you know, they don't want to rock the boat too much, least of all with, with, um, with central government. Um, they want, they don't want to make things too overcomplicated either. So we end up perhaps with something that doesn't actually correspond to what the poor old um, voters have actually voted for. So it becomes sort of profoundly undemocratic. Um, uh, Tony, can I can I just push you for a minute a to a, a direct question to catch you on because oh, I can yes. see a few hands well, going. I mean, up. my question would probably be, oh, you know, uh, do you agree with any of that? Um, that would be sort of question one. Question two would be, um, once this local plan, when and if this local plan is ever produced and we've been waiting five years I think it is for the local plan so far so perhaps we we'll be waiting another five years who knows um when and if that's that we, we that ever sees the light of day again I mean it's back to the sort of democracy question I mean how robust are, are, is the sort of comeback on it in other words yeah. you know could we get into the situation where some some local plan that doesn't really satisfy the voters you know, come is produced. You know the officers are happy with it for whatever reason. But what kind of comeback is there structured within the system to actually do something about a local plan that we, you know, we 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 don't like. We we ha we poor residents think is dreadful. Um, I think in, in answer to your question, I think there are the, the, the council's job is to make a plan in the interest of the greater good. So if they've got a very strong voice one way, they might have a very strong voice the other way. And, it, you know, a council's job is to manage the different needs across its patch and make sure that it is making decisions in its local plan in the interest of the greater good. And that's not going to be you know, we're not we're, we're all going to have find something in it that we don't like. But I think the key point in terms of the way that the planning profession has been operating is I live in brief risk assessments. My job is to go into a council and I, I've just come out of one recently where the local plan working group didn't really like what its officers were saying. 
um, and I was brought in and the officers actually were really, really good and they had made some very good decisions. And, you know, my job was to give the bad news that I thought they were right. Um, but it was just that that second opinion, have we got it right? And, you know, officers, the, the planning profession and local government are under real pressure because local government in itself is totally risk adverse now. It doesn't like taking risks. So that pushback, that bravery that perhaps we don't see so much in the elected members is because their councillors, their planning portfolio holders are going up to government and civil services are saying, if you don't do this, we're going to take it away from you. You have to meet your needs. And it's like Chinese whispers, it comes back into the council and says, if we don't meet our needs, we're going to lose control of our local plan. And that's how it plays out. And actually, that's not the reality. And what I'm saying is, uh, you know, what we need is some brave councillors. We need some brave leadership to say, actually, we, are, we, we, we hear what you're saying, professionals, but is there a different way we can do this to make it more acceptable, to make the local plan acceptable? And you're right, it is really complex, which is why I go into councils and help with the, manage that relationship between the councillors and the, 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 the officers. And I never go into a council and tell them they're wrong or tell them they're right or tell them what to do. My job is to do a risk assessment and tell them that, you know, because at, back to that point, it's not black and white. If you apply different judgments and different values, you will come up with a different answer. Officers are there, the planners are there to make sure that plan is technically sound and legally compliant. The rest is up to the, the councils, the councillors. So if you've got a plan that gets to Reg 19 stage and councillors have not been involved, you are in deep trouble, frankly, uh, because that's not the council's plan. That is a technically uh, technical plan that might pass a muster, uh, an examination, but it is not the council's plan. So I think the risk assessment side of this, you know, there are every option. If, a, if Elmbridge went into an examination with no green belt released and they're not ticking the box in terms of the numbers, there are risks involved in that. But if they go in and they meet their numbers and release green belt, there are huge risks involved in that. And, you know, how much are the councillors willing to take that risk? How much are they going to be brave and show some leadership? And you know, and I, I and I personally, um, I think doing that through a coalition is really tricky because you've got, and and I and again, I'm, you know, a lot of independents are independents. Resident associations have different priorities and different values to the next resident association councillor, um, and and if you've got in the mix the Lib Dems as part of that coalition, it is a bit more difficult. So the first thing. And the thing that holds them all together is the vision and strategy. And the Conservatives as well now, but they come together and say, yes, some of us don't like this and some of us don't like this, but this is what we want to do in Elmbridge. This is our place shaping vision for Elmbridge that we all agree is needed. And we haven't seen that. We don't know what that looks like. And I suspect most of the councillors don't know what that looks like. It's almost like they've missed a whole stage because that's the glue that holds the councillors together. That well, is the thing that holds if them I, together. If I could, I'll be very brief, but if I, I, I just totally agree with that. You know, I mean, I've, I've argued um, that uh, we need to understand the political complexion of this, this new council because until... I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the local plan specifically, because until that is resolved, um, I, I can't see how we can make we can make sensible progress. Because it's got to be the political vision or the political values, if you like, that are driving what goes in to the plan. Yeah. We used to have sustainable community strategies up until another thing that was abolished in the Localism Act and the sustainable community strategies were the, the shared community and political vision which a local plan had to address and that's the bit we've been trying to fill since 2010. Uh, I'll just jump in very quickly with a bit of information that um, I've sat in on at least two, if not three, Thames and Western Green Residents Association meetings where uh, Councillor Karen Randolph is the planning portfolio holder for 
Elmbridge Borough Council. And she has repeatedly said on those conference calls this year, 2021, that she does not know what is in the local plan and that she will have to wait, like all the other councillors, to see what the officers bring forth. Now, everything that you've just said about this being a collaborative and cooperative plan where councillors and officers work together, where the councillors uh, should be setting the strategic direction and, and working with the residents to work out what they see as the vision and the placemaking ambition for Elmbridge, and the officers are there as the paid professionals, as the civil servants to advise professionally how those aims and objectives are met and if they can be met, and to give that professional advice, working hand in glove with the councillors. What I'm hearing from the planning portfolio holder is that she doesn't know what's in the local plan and neither do the councillors. So that to me, tells me that that is a fundamental breakdown in what should be a close collaborative relationship between our elected, democratically elected councillors who are there to represent us, who stood on manifestos stating their aims and objectives and what they wanted to achieve for their residents, that their residents read and said, I like that that's been written, I will vote for that person, the person gets elected to be a councillor to represent those people and they're being kept out of the process. They are being shut out or kept out or whatever. Uh, you know, Either they are not making the effort to get involved with the officers or the officers aren't engaging with them. Whatever's happened, that relationship is not working and we're going to end up with an officer-led plan presented. Mm. Uh, that's interesting, Paul, because... Um, it, it comes down to when the plan comes out, who takes the flack, doesn't it? Do you think people are just trying to cover their backs and it's kind of, it wasn't me, it was there, you know, nobody kind of wants to take responsibility for it. It will be, it will well, be. The because stops it's with the councillors though. It's, yeah. it, you know, yeah. again, back to the point, if it's if a local plan is supposed to be part of the democratic process, it doesn't matter what the officers say, the buck, the decision making, the buck stops with the councillors, whatever, the officers say or whatever they recommend if the if the members aren't don't like what they see that is their that is their job to show some leadership um now we've got a whole load of new councillors at Elmbridge and that may change but at the end of the day you know it's not one single council it is got to be the council's plan that is presented to examination um, and at the moment if paul if what paul is saying then that's quite worrying if that's true then that is very worrying and it's very hard to get them to work together as you say with a the coalition there's a lot of finger pointing and wagging one side against the other which doesn't really help the process of of coalescing around a common end point but yeah, anyway I would just you... like to, i'd just like to support what Paul said, I mean, it's, um, that is, you know, spot on, really. Um, it's, uh, and, and, and I mean, on, on a sort of general perspective, I mean, just from your experience of the way that councillors and um, officers collaborate, uh, or don't, um, oh, well, I've never known a situation in the way that Paul's described. And I've worked with a lot of councils. It has always been a collaboration um, and it has always at the heart of it had the cabinet or uh, and a some form of local plan working group. And quite often that's cross party. The, mm -hmm. the council that I was talking about that I've just finished with, they set up a very, very much a cross party local plan working group as opposed to one that reflected the leadership because they wanted all the councillors, regardless of party, regardless of minority, majority, to own the plan. And um, so I've never, in my experience, come across a plan making process where it has been done purely by the officers and the councillors are not involved. That that's not something that I'm familiar with. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I think I wouldn't say sort of, obviously I'm not, none of us are sadly privy to what is actually going on. Um, perhaps we should be privy to the discussions about, you know, shaping the local plan. I mean, that's a, 
that's another another matter. But um, I don't think we're saying purely driven by, you know, we're not saying it's purely driven by the, the count by the officers. But there is no doubt that um as Paul has, has mentioned, I mean, there are you know key individuals in key um holding key positions who uh, seem very ready to um be drawn along by what the um well, well I think what you're trying to say Tony, is that they're not showing the courage and the leadership that well, Catriona was saying about before yeah. those people in the key positions I, are leading the way are they with a very clear objective well, and the, the, my when question you've got the planning going... portfolio holder who's holding the planning portfolio is mm. on a public zoom meeting telling the Thames Ditton and Western Green residents, I mean, Mark Herbert was on those calls, I was on those calls, was I, I think Tony was on the calls, yeah. where she's saying, we don't know what's in the plan. So yeah. either she is not engaging with the offices or she's misleading us. And yeah. it's one of those two, it can't be anything else. Yeah. You know, it's one of those two situations, I'm afraid. And the thing is that where Katrina's saying that she hasn't seen this anywhere else, I took it upon myself to uh, write to um either the it was either the leader or if i could find the information the chair or the uh, head of their local plan working group for um spellthorn for uh tandridge for epsom and yule for um woking etc i contacted local boroughs around us and i asked them all um could you please tell me what is the process for your local plan making with regards to your collaboration with officers could you just give me an overview? And I said, I'm only asking as a, as a, as a normal resident. And I had from, uh, I had 60%, 70% replies. And all of those replies said, we work collaboratively. We meet regularly. We have monthly updates on the local plan. And this was either in their local plan working groups or their equivalent thereof. Um, or it was the leader of the council who was saying we meet and talk to our officers about the local plan on a regular cadence. And yes, we know what's going on. And of course, there is obviously a degree of discretion and confidentiality around the local plan, because there will be times exactly as you know, Katrina says, they've got to explore all the avenues. And sometimes unpopular things will be suggested such that has to be thought about, has to be mulled over and maybe discounted. So I can appreciate that some of it's done confidentially or discreetly. But the point they made, all of them, was it's a collaborative process. And the only place that I've come across that I asked, because I asked, um, in fact, the Long Ditton councillor who, who uh, has did not stand at the last election, uh, councillor Kapadia, I asked her, um, how, how does this work in Elmbridge? And she said, we don't get involved. We're not allowed to. We're not allowed to intervene with the officers because that would then make it a political play. That's amazing. That's amazing. I but, had a 30 so minute break... conversation with her about that. Can I break into this to go to Kath, who I know has been yeah, waiting? Sorry. I'm going to have to come to back to a minute. Sorry, Kath, I'll go to Kath and then we'll go to you, Greg. That's OK. I mean, th thank you very much for inviting me. And, and I find it fascinating and I have lots and lots of questions. Um, but in terms of what might be relevant to, to you guys, uh, I've been exploring the possibility, I, I accept you know, Green Belt is a, a strategic sort of um, policy constraint, but I'd be interested to know your experience on the, um, on the more the physical constraints. So for example, in Spellthorn, we have, you know, uh, our borough is 16% water, um, and then we have, you know, other you know, physical, really, you know, we're quite highly constrained, physical constraints, Ramsar sites and stuff like that. So I'm aware that Surrey talk about growth being proportionate. And I know we can't necessarily argue the point on Greenbelt per se, but in terms of our absolute physical constraints, in terms of moving from stage one, as Catriona said, to stage two and going from policy off to policy on, is, I don't know what um, Elmbridge's situation is in, in terms of their other absolute constraints, but is there an argument for, for saying that the housing target, for example, could, should be constrained by the percentage of, of your, you know, maybe your water content if you've got reservoirs or some other way? Uh, I'm interested in how, how it was done, Catriona as well, in Surrey, in the area planned before, because 
I mean, we had 60% or so um, green belt, 65% green belts in Spellthorn and Elmbridge, you know, is probably quite um, high um, green belt as well. Whether that in itself is a, is a way of arguing that the housing, the standard housing figure should be constrained to allow for that fact that you, you know, if, if you take it to an extreme and you say that you're 95% water, you wouldn't expect 100% of your standard method housing target to be put on 5% of the land, if you if you see where I'm going with it. So is there an argument that you guys could use in Elmbridge as well, where you have some absolute constraints, which which are, you know, you, you, you can say, you know, have a number against them. I know there's all sorts of other constraints about climate change and air pollution and, and all those other things, um, and Greenbelt being one of them. But is that are there things that you could sort of pin hold your hat on and say that those are constraints that we could use in terms of moving from a policy off to a policy on figure? I think Elbridge is quite different to Spelthorn. Spelthorn is has far, far more of the, the sort of the water constraints that you, you talk about and the, the 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 sort of specially protected areas than than Spelthorn. But these are absolutely, you know. As, as important as Greenbelt as, as anything else. Um, you know, it's not just Greenbelt that the, the government say you've got to apply, it's anything that is nationally important. So, you know, a lot of places like Surrey Heath have got a lot of um, European designations and they are highly constrained areas, Thames Basin Heaths and, and things like yeah. that. So, you know, Surrey in itself, with areas of outstanding natural beauty and everything like that is I mean, what 74% green built, but that doesn't take account of the huge other constraints across Surrey and they all have to be factored in. Elmbridge, I would say the, the biggest argument Elmbridge have beyond green belt is around um, infrastructure constraints. Um, and I think that's, you know, anywhere again along the edge of London experiences that um, and the more housing you put in without dealing with the deficit around infrastructure, the more that infrastructure will crumble. Um, and an interesting point um, worth thinking about. So I have been working with the local authorities in Surrey for the last four years on their place ambition, um, Surrey place ambition for 2050. and. There is eight strategic opportunity areas across um, Surrey and they're based on uh, where the strategic investment is needed mainly um, to go in and uh, to go into areas to sort of uh, where you get your biggest bang for your buck in terms of jobs and, and houses and things like that. So Elmbridge is the only district in the whole of Surrey that doesn't have uh, a strategic opportunity area because it's highly constrained from its infrastructure perspective and it doesn't it doesn't offer anything in terms of its contribution towards Surrey. Now that doesn't downplay Elmbridge's role, it just says there's no space to do that. So, you know, um, Wesley New Community, whether you like it or not, is one of the strategic opportunity areas um, because it's linked very much to, to Woking uh, and you've got a few other new communities being proposed, but, you know, Elmbridge doesn't have anything to offer in that sense. But I, but I think Cath Spelthorn has got a lot of these big physical constraints to factor in, um, and that you know that means that you are looking much more a very small number of urban areas to meet as much of your need as possible, um, and that you know that these are all very credible arguments about why you shouldn't have to meet your full needs. Brighton and Hove, it was all physical constraints mainly from them. It was the, the channel. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, we do seem to have hit a bit of reticence when, when we brought it up before the last, I mean, the leadership has changed now um, slightly, but when we've kind of questioned them about when we're, when we're going to be looking at the policy on side of things, at what point in the process would that normally be? Is that, is that before Reg, the Reg 19 thing? Is that still part of the oh, Absolutely. I mean, back to my point about a plan starts with a vision and a plan starts with a strategy in terms of you know I put it very simple a plan is about what you're trying to change over the next 10 to 15 years across your local area and what the best way of doing that is that ticks all the boxes to ensure that it's 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 a positive change so whilst you get lots more development inevitably because you are trying to meet housing needs and other needs it's about the impact on the environment, the impact on social infrastructure as much as um, transport infrastructure and things like that. So, you know, the 
you know that the that if if you started with that and that should come out following the reg 18 stage so your reg 18 stage is about your options all the different options back to that point about there's more one, more than one way to skin a cat so the reg 18 is about looking at all your different options that give you the right result then the work between reg 18 and 19 is about looking at what the best solution is for your area that ticks as many boxes as possible and doesn't compromise some of these big issues, these national constraints and these environmental constraints and has a positive outcome. And you know, I always say a plan should be vision led and outcome focused because you should be very clear at 15 and 15 years time what you're actually trying to achieve. And you know, the interventions that go into that around site allocations, around your different policies, but they're, they're also down to things like, uh, you know, a car parking charging, for example, um, and all that sort of stuff. If Elmbridge is serious about climate change, and I keep hearing councillors tell me it is their number one priority, that needs to be reflected in their local plan. And if it's not reflected in their local plan, they're not serious about it. You know, it's as simple as that. But just on, so on the Surrey Place ambition, so how, how comfortable are you with the fact that that has taken account of some of these other big priority areas like climate change because reading through that document there's an awful lot about economic growth and um, GVA or whatever and, and, and attaining five percent GVA up until 2030 and there doesn't yeah. seem there doesn't seem an awful lot in there about biodiversity or sustainability um, apart from in respect where it supports the economic growth. Yeah, so what we're doing now is the implementation framework, which the place ambition sits above, and a lot of that is around uh, biodiversity improvement areas. It's a lot, it's around we're developing a, a green infrastructure strategy across Surrey, um, a huge amount of things, climate change strategy across Surrey, and the local climate change strategies. These are all huge features in in how it's getting taken forward, and the you know again it's even with the Surrey Place ambition, it's about having a, a clear vision for, for what's needed. And one of the things that we are trying to look at is an alternative way of measuring success. So it's not about GVA, it's not about GDP and all that. It's it's looking at, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Welsh model, they've got um, uh, a wellbeing commissioner and they measure things on wellbeing, environmental wellbeing, uh, health, uh, community wellbeing and all that. And, the measure of success in terms of growth is very different to traditional measures around housing targets and GVA. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is move away from these traditional ways of measuring what good looks like to something that is capturing the things you've just mentioned. So, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say to you, show you right now, but, but, uh, but I wouldn't be doing the work across Surrey if I didn't think it was going to do what you've just said it needs to do and but there is you know there's a really strong in economic argument for Surrey to support the national economy as well it always has done and yeah. you've got you know go for it's a balance so it's that, definitely it, a balance. absolutely a balance not at all costs and that's no. the point. well and that's but that's my concern with the local industrial strategy that you know it is is talked about by the LEP the local enterprise partnership, both by cost of, um, coast to coast, I think, and um, enterprise M3. And I wouldn't worry, they're going to go soon anyway, so. <laughs> Are they? Are they? Mm, Boris is not a fan. <laughs> Okay. They may not they may not go entirely, but they will change drastically as this bit. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, totally sorry. Can I give the last question to Greg? Because he's been waiting with his hand up. And uh, and then if it's a short question, we'll come to you, Tony. Because it is coming well, Jan, up. Well, Jan, Jan had his hand up. Um, yeah. uh, Katrina, I was just picking up your point. And thanks again. I echo everybody else. So it's fascinating. Thank yeah. you. Um, just picking up your point about early on in the process, uh, the um, areas reaching out to other areas and um, forming an alliance perhaps uh, would have been a, something very positive to do. And we now, in fact, now we do have an alliance in uh, Elmbridge and uh, Tony and, and Paul are very active in this. And I'd just like to put this to Jan as to how we could maybe reach out uh, to Spellthorn. And I mean, Paul is great that he's actually written to other areas and whether, whether even at this stage of the process this could actually happen because I think the landscape has changed a bit because, and, and AERC has demonstrated that so uh, perhaps that could happen. I think, I think also just worth noting Greg is that whilst 
four years ago, the local plans were running on slightly different timetables. There's quite a bit of alignment now, so they're all sort of running into similar stages. Great. So, Jan, what would you think about that? <laughs> It's not. Can you hear it? <laughs> no, I think it would, yeah. no, it would be great to work together. I mean, I really think that's the only way to stop the sort of destruction that's really ongoing, especially in relation to the green belt. So I'm just rethinking the spell on green belt strategy. So it'd be great to liaise more because I, because I feel that councillors, certainly in spell on, but generally, they're benefiting politically from this narrative that it isn't their fault. If yeah. they could pretend the housing figures are mandatory, which they're constantly pretending, um, and then they still stand up and pretend to be the champions of the green belt, but they can't do any different than what they're doing, then, then well, not only are they lying to residents or not, they're absolving their kind of responsibility, mm -hmm. but we, we need to hold them to task, really, and try to, um, you know, dispel this, these kind of myths and experts like Katrina are just so important. Um, but I think in the end, we need to try to create the real political will by councillors to actually mm. take a step in the right direction. I mean, what Katrina said that the means are there, but the will is actually lacking. You know, nothing stops them from putting, from arguing that, you know, green belt shouldn't be released, putting forward um, uh, local plans with a vision. But, but they want to hide behind officers and, and they want to not show their cards, in my view. And mm -hmm. we've had that in Spellthorn where, you know, they, there's a clear interest by the, by the well, where the local plan task group, the officers and, and the lead councillor had this bad cop, good cop routine, but it's evident what's being played out. Um, so, so, yeah, I think if we can liaise more and, you know, if you do a protest, we come from Spellthorn and we make up numbers and vice versa, because I think it's really, really important. Because if we don't do it, then it won't happen. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't think there's many councillors that actually really want to do what they're doing. I genuinely don't. I think the vast majority of councillors, particularly in Surrey, would like a good outcome where they don't have to release any green belt and that they don't have to meet the needs in full. If they were offered an option, a way out, I think they would grab it with both hands. The problem at the moment is they're not seeing the options in front of them and they're they are not managing the risks of the different options. And that's the frustration. And I think most planning officers actually would willingly take a way out of this as well. So it, it can't be done just through community groups. If, if at all possible, this has to be a real collaboration of local authorities, um, officers, councillors and local communities, which is, you know, why we're in, you know, it's such a shame we've got to Reg 19 stage in most of these local plans and everybody is feeling very unhappy. Yeah. I personally think maybe Spellthorn is, uh, is an exception, but I've never seen any willingness to get any expert advice to the contrary. I mean, the last article, I think I can put the, the link in, where Katrina, you gave your advice, and the person who's now heading the Environment and Sustainability Committee, which is the committee uh, deciding the local plan, is just pretending he knows how it is. Um, so he, he just... He, well... So I, I think, um, unfortunately, there has been a lot of lobbying behind the scenes for certain release of green belts, whether it's for green belt sites, whether it's, you know, local sports clubs that want to build their new facilities and they think they're going to make a windfall. Um, I certainly have never seen in spells on any, any willingness to, to look at alternatives, because if there had been, I definitely would have stuck around. Um, and that... In, but there has been a consensus amongst pretty much the majority of councillors. Um, and looking, for example, at the outcome of the consultation, the first consultation, the council subsequently did a document and it just rebutted every single point raised. I mean, it's so tragic. There wasn't a single point <laughs> that any resident made that the council was willing to accept. So, so it's just this, this hell-bent 
I hope it's an exception, but I think it's probably not an exception. But the single mindedness, we want to do what we want to do. And the residents are in the way of us doing that, actually. Yeah. So, so the consultation was just a lip service then. It was just a, a show. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we had an issues and options consultation previously with four options when this should have been an open ended one. What do you want for Spellthorn? And it said, if you don't look like any of the four, well, then you have to choose the one that you dislike least. <laughs> so, I mean, people were shoehorned very, very cleverly into options that pretty much all had some green bad release or high rises in it. So mm -hmm. it, it it's not the process that, that Katrina says it should be with developing a positive vision and then relying on the, what people and residents actually want. Yeah. So that's, yeah. you know, really shocking. Right, well, it's gone half past eight. So, uh, Tony, do you mind well, if I, we wrap up here? Or I well, I was, just gonna, I was just going to very simply ask Katrina, you know, given everything that we've heard, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Uh, good question. Um, I was, I offered to help Elmbridge out four years ago as, as Paul and Mark and others know, I offered my services free to go in and help them and was very, very firmly put in my place, um, shall we say. Um, so I, you know, I, I've never been, I'm not I'm not overly optimistic unless unless the leadership changes its views unless there's some pushback from the councillors and and I don't mean just Karen I mean the cabinet I think um we will end up with something that that is going to be quite difficult for local communities in Elmbridge um so it does come down to how strong our councils are going to be in terms of pushing back. What I would hate to see is a plan that that is made public and published at cabinet or full council. There is a plan that the officers, uh, the councillors, then reject because that will look bad on the whole council, um, and that might make it very difficult moving forward. So, if there is a plan that is being discussed that the councillors don't know what's in it, then I would say they need to find out pretty damn quick what's in it before it gets anywhere in the public arena. Because if it says something that, that is not going to be palatable at all, then, then they're going to be in trouble. Even if they reject it, uh, you know, it will have consequences. So I, I'm optimistic yesterday, less optimistic today. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you be professionally neutral. I'm professionally neutral. <laughs> I that we're going to end up with something that doesn't really please anybody, but it's a kind of, you know, a bit like a, a kind of a camel, you know, put together by a committee so it doesn't actually do anything for anybody in the end. Decisive decision making is needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, Please, what about, you have a point. Yeah, I was going to say, what about Surrey? They seem to be quite progressive. Can they not give a lead to Elmbridge? I'm sure they could, but um, again, the, the whole relationship management issue in terms of local government restructuring and unitarization has got in the way in terms of relationships. So I think Surrey will be treading very carefully. Um, it's a shame because you know Tim Oliver is an ex Elmbridge councillor, but I suspect he will want to tre tread very carefully because of the, the, the wider noise around local government restructuring and things like that. And of course it would all be solved if we had one big unitary. <laughs> if we had one big what? Discussion, one big unitary council, but yeah. I think that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have you back on that one. So if, that's if very provocative. Time, uh, I think we're going to call it a day now because I desperately need a cup of tea. Uh, oh, but, I was going for the wine. <laughs> <laughs> we did that earlier. And, the, uh, and it's raining now, so yeah. oh, the, summer has, the summer has officially ended. It's <laughs> <laughs> but a really big thank you to you, yeah. Catriona, for uh, giving us the time. And it's been really, really helpful too. Because, you know, now the local plan comes out, we've got great insight into it. So, yeah, round of applause. And anytime, you. anytime. Most enjoyable. Much. And, uh, and thanks for letting us record it. because and, really and I do require wine as when, when we are allowed to meet in pubs and things. I do require wine as a thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> you will get some. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Definitely recorded. Yeah. Right. Thanks yeah. so much. And I'm going to close the meeting now. Yeah. Bye. Lovely to see Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.